Okay, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And thank you very much for uh, proposing me to present in this great uh, sister talk series. So I think you have all of my background, so I won't <laughs> get, uh, get in much more detail. And uh, today I will mostly present my PhD work that I did in the University of Bordeaux. And I will talk eventually a little bit about what are the future plans here uh, in the, the University of South Carolina, because now I'm working as a postdoc in uh, Dr. Desai uh, lab. So I won't tell you what a PhD is because in this room, everybody knows. Uh, what I can tell is that it will happen suddenly. And, um, and in USA, uh, it represents between 16 to 66% of postural people that will suffer from language impairment. Uh, and it will have a major impact on quality of life, obviously, because it will impact the social sphere of the patient, uh, the family sphere, and also the working sphere. What I want to highlight is also that sometimes and often maybe uh, this language impairment will not come alone and uh, there will be also additional cognitive impairments such as um, working memory loss or executive function impairments and this can also uh, worsen aphasia symptoms and also uh, being a barrier for aphasia recovery. Talking about aphasia recovery, well, we'll know what the gold standard is. Uh, this is not surprising. Speech language therapy is still the gold standard that have been shown in many, many studies and in many, um, and in the study uh, of Brady in 2022. Uh, but we also have some new techniques uh, such as non-invasive brain stimulation. And today I will talk mostly about repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, so RTMS, that can also help recovery. The idea is to implement um, something new, uh, something that can be added to speech language treatment. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, RTMS, uh, so this is the setting we had in Bordeaux. Uh, what you can see here is a coil. So we send an electric current into this coil and this electric current in this coil will induce a magnetic field. And you can have different, um, different type of device to um, navigate to your uh, target, cortical target. Here we have, you can see on the, the yellow arrow, we have a neural navigation system. So you can choose a target and uh, induce a neuronal depolarization on the cortical target. Uh, thanks to different parameters, such as high or low frequency or continuous or intermittent theta bursts, uh, you can induce different type of, um, of activation in the brain, such as inhibition of certain areas or facilitation of certain areas. So what about RTMS efficacy in post stroke aphasia? What do we know from the literature? So we did a systematic review um, on, um, on RTMS efficacy in the recovery of post stroke aphasia. And what we highlighted in that review that was interesting is that RTMS is... Um, has good effect on language recovery with or without language therapy or even without uh, language stimulation. Sometimes it was uh, just RTMS alone and it, was, uh, it, has been, it has shown some improvement in language. Um, so this is the first thing we learn and this is also something that is different from TDCS, for example. Uh, the second thing is that some studies have shown improvement in language in both subacute and chronic phase of aphasia. And the third thing is that it was, it has been, it has shown improvement in different uh, language domains such as naming, comprehension, but also more, um, how can I say, more broad domains such as everyday communication. Um, thanks to all this. Uh, studies. Uh, it has been very recently recommended in France as a clinical care. Uh, to my knowledge, this is the first country and the only country <laughs> to recommend it as a clinical care. So we are using it as a clinical care apart from research in Bordeaux, for example, and in some rehabilitation center, it's not very used in all country, but it's coming. So it's also very interesting. And of course, we can talk about it because as Dirk mentioned, I was, I was a speech language pathologist. And so clinical care is super important for me. So uh, 
I will just click OK so it will go out. OK, so um, based on this literature review, we also highlighted some limitations in this study. The first limitation uh, we highlighted was that the description of the language profile of the patient or just the profile, even cognitive profile of the patient was not super precise. And so this is one of the limitations because most of the time we will just have like, this is that type of aphasia, broca's aphasia, for example, but not exactly what type of impairment, do they have phonological impairments, semantic impairments, uh, et cetera. The second point was the theory of transcranial imbalance. This is the theory that is mainly used in most of RTR mass study and non-invasive brain stimulation study. And this theory um, hypothesized that before any brain region, any brain lesion, you will have your both hemisphere being exercise, exercising on one another, a contralateral inhibition. And after a stroke, for example, in aphasia, mostly we have left hemispheric stroke. So after a stroke, you will have a hyperactivation of your right hemisphere and an hyperactivation of your left hemisphere. So the idea will be to return to the balance. And for that, in non-invasive brain stimulation, we will use inhibitory stimulation targeting the right hemisphere or facilitatory stimulation targeting the left hemisphere. But this theory presupposes that we have a maladaptive role of the right hemisphere, right? So this is why we think that we can question this theory and that it may not apply to all patients. The third point was about the cortical targets. So in most of the cases, in most of the studies, um, um, all the studies targeted the inferior frontal gyrus, so the right inferior frontal gyrus, which is uh, the homologue of Broca's in the right hemisphere. And this is really reductive of the, all the areas that are in charge of language. So this is also something we wanted to highlight because maybe we can try another target for specific language impairment to try to improve the size effect of uh, RTMS. So based on all those limitations, we led to the question of my PhD, which was what is the potential of an individualization of RTMS for people with post stroke aphasia according to clinical characteristics and localization size. So the idea was also to propose something that could be adapted to clinical practice. Okay, too many animations. <laughs> uh, so we developed different studies. The first one was really about this transcarlosal imbalance. And for this study, we focused on people with severe aphasia because we think that for this type of people, maybe the right hemisphere could help in recovery. So that's, that was our guess. The second study was about this cortical target. And for, for this second study, we tried a different target, which was a motor cortex target. For people with specific impairment, they had phonological impairments. And for the third part of, well, one part was on my PhD, another part was from Ioanna um, Ciclafidu study, and I will present it briefly, but we focused on bilingual aphasia. So bilinguals are very common in South Carolina, but they are not that common in France. <laughs> and there is not a lot of studies on non-invasive brain stimulation and bilingual aphasia. And so when we had this patient with bilingual aphasia, we wanted to try to see what hap what's happening in both of her languages. So this is what we try. And one of very atypical profile we had, and this is really from clinic because we received a patient that was left-handed and had a right hemispheric stroke and presented a severe non-fluent aphasia. So a very atyp uh, atypical profile. And for the, this patient, it didn't came for research at first. It came for clinical, for RTMS in clinical, but we didn't know what to propose, right? So we proposed to him to be included in a whole study just for himself. <laughs> and he came during three periods of six weeks. And we tried each time different type of simulation to see if one simulation was good for him and if we could find what was the best treatment for him. So today I will present only the first two studies and I will discuss a little bit about Joanna's study about bilingual aphasia. And if you're interested about the left-handed patient, I put the reference here. Okay.
Uh, I'm sorry if I'm speaking too quickly, especially with my English, but okay. <laughs> so uh, about this first study about transcarnosal impedance. So this theory, as I mentioned before, could be put into question uh, because we know, and this is one of the studies from HOPE in 2017 that highlighted that, that the right hemisphere can have both beneficial role, but also negative role in post-trochaphasia recovery. And this is what this study show. And this positive or negative role of the right hemisphere might depend on different parameters, such as aphasia severity, the size and localization of the lesion. So we can question, that's why we can question the theory. Uh, there is one study on RTMS that proposed a comparison between facilitatory and inhibitory stimulation targeting the right inferior frontal cortex. So they did this comparison. And what they found is that both type of stimulation, inhibition and facilitation helped in the recovery of language impairments in post aphasia, and they were both better than sham stimulation. However, they also highlighted that inhibitory stimulation was better than facilitatory stimulation. So what was interesting first is that both stimulation are supposed to be antagonists, right? And they both targeting the same targets, they both induce language improvement. So this is something we couldn't expect really. So um, what we can also learn from this study is that they did not um, talk a lot about the localization or the size of the lesion and also about the severity of aphasia. So what we think is that maybe by targeting a more specific population, we could try to criticize this theory of interhemispheric imbalance. And this is what we did. So our hypothesis was that in severe aphasia, severe chronic post aphasia, uh, um, facilitatory RTMS will have a better effect on language recovery compared to inhibitory RTMS, targeting the classic target, if I can say it like that, the right inferior frontal gyps. Okay, I have to warn you, the results were not what we expected, <laughs> just to warn you. Okay, um, so we included six participants with post stroke aphasia. As you can see here on the right, they didn't have the same type of lesion at all. That was not part of our inclusion criteria, and we can talk a little bit about, about it later, but of course, that was a big limitation of our study among others. <laughs> uh, the intervention was targeting the right inferior frontal gyrus and we used inhibition or facilitation. And uh, for tasks, we used a picture naming task. Picture naming task in severe patient with aphasia, not a great idea. <laughs> but this is also the task that is really well used in a lot of RTMS studies. So we wanted to try this task. If I had to redo the study, I would probably change this task, but this is a task we use. And we use also a lexical decision. Um, the method for this study was a single case experimental design. I don't know if some of you are aware, aware of that type of design, but it works like this. So you have only intrapatient analysis, so there is no control group. And the main point is that you have repetitive measure. So that means you have at least five points per phase. So during the baseline, you have five times the patient completing, at least five times, completing both uh, picture naming and lexical decision. And during the intervention, again, they will repeat it again. And this helps us to control, for example, for a learning effect. Um, what is important also in that type of design is the bas baseline randomization. That means the baseline length will not be the same for all participants. And I will present it later and I put some references if you want to uh, dig a little bit more on SCAD methodology. What is great about that type of methodology is that it's high level of evidence because of this controlling of the fluctuation that can happen. This is why it's very, very interesting. So high level of evidence and it's also very adapted for an individual or small group. And because we wanted to try to individualize the treatment, that was the best approach, I guess. However, of course, there is negative point and the big negative point was that it's not representative because we focus on a few population. 
So normally your population is supposed to be super homogeneous. If you remember our legends, it was not really the case, but this is, uh, this is research. Uh, so about the experimental design. So for half of the participants, we had a facilitatory period first, then a washout period and an inhibitory period first, periods uh, in the second time. And for the three other participants, we had it the other way around to control the order of the simulation, order effects. Okay. And about the design during those two periods of time. So the participants were seen during six weeks, three times a week. So three times a week, they completed both lexical decision and picture naming task. And for the first two participants, you can see they have two weeks baseline then two weeks treatment, then two weeks follow-up. During the treatment, they had um, six sessions of uh, RTMS, and that was the case for all participants. But if you remember, I mentioned that the baseline length will not be the same across participants. So that means that we sort of randomized the baseline length for the other type of participants. So the baseline was not the same, but the duration of the intervention was the same. Okay, and we are doing only intrapatient analysis. Okay, we are not comparing patients to each other. Okay, so that was for the method. About the results, please stick with me. <laughs> uh, so I presented the result like this in the table because it would be more convenient to, to understand. But the first thing that hi was highlighted that is that for three participants, this is what you can see in white here. I don't know if you can see my, yeah in Y here, is that we, can, we could not calculate it, the result in picture naming accuracy because the participants were not producing enough words. So we were not able to calculate any st statistical test or even to present it in a visual way. So that was the case for half of the participants. For one participant, we didn't have any significant effect in both facilitatory on the top and inhibitory stimulation on the bottom. And for two participants, for one participant, we had a positive effect of the stimulation for both facilitatory stimulation and inhibitory stimulation. And for the last participant, we had a positive effect on, uh, on inhibitory stimulation. So right now, our hypothesis is not really uh, in the way to be validated. And we are more in the same type of results I presented from the previous study, right? But we wanted to dig a little bit more. And to dig a little bit more, we looked at type of errors. Uh, in type of errors, it was not better. <laughs> For um, the th uh, patient three, we had same type of results. So an improvement in both inhibitory and facilitatory stimulation. And for P6, still a decrease in the number of perseverations, which was um, estimated to be a positive effect of the simulation, inhibitory simulation. But what we have here is the appearance of a negative effect of the simulation. That means that after the simulation, the patient was producing more uh, semantic errors after facilitatory simulation. That was not expected, not at all, because from all the study we have on post-stroke aphasia and RTMS, there is not a lot of studies that reported negative effect. There is actually two cases of negative effect among a lot of participants. So that was really not expected. We can discuss it uh, later, but that was not expected. And that's why I think this is also important to discuss that kind of study with very heterogeneous results, because most of the time we are so happy when we have good results that we're going to our following our hypothesis. But this is also so important to show some negative results and heterogeneous results like this. And this is also heterogeneous because we are focusing on one patient by one and not at a group level. That's why it looks super uh, messy and heterogeneous. And what about our lexical decisions? So the good thing was that we were able to calculate the effect of RTMS in lexical decision for all participants. The bad thing was that we highlighted again negative effect. We highlighted negative effect for inhibitory stimulation for P1 and for P5 we highlighted negative effects for both facilitatory and inhibitory stimulation. And for P6 this time 
it benefited from uh, facilitatory stimulation better than inhibitory stimulation. So what can we do about our, these results? Well, I guess we can say that first, our hypothesis is that for severe patients, uh, facilitatory stimulation will be better than inhibitory stimulation to improve language processes can be rejected because we have so heterogeneous results. But it's still worth discussing about these results in more detail. So for P3 and P6, we have mostly positive results for both inhibitory, facilitatory RTMS. So that reflects individual variability, right? Because for P1, P2, P4, and P5, we have no, no impact of RTMS or negative impact. So that highlights also the, um, uh, the major thing about um, single case experimental design is that we can also learn by taking patient one by one. And this is interesting because we have a huge variability in aphasia symptoms and aphasia lesion and everything that it's also interesting to be taking patient one by one. Uh, what we can also question still is the theory of interhemispheric imbalance, right? Because if we can definitely not validate our hypothesis, this theory didn't work for some of our participants because inhibitory stimulation didn't improve aphasia symptoms for several participants in this study. Um, the third thing is, we talked a little bit about it, is the difference in lesion between participants. I'm quoting one meta-analysis of PI in 2023 that highlighted, uh, that was a lesion symptom mapping in picture naming, and they highlighted different areas in the brain that were super important for picture naming tasks. And what we what we've seen, and I think what we need to dig a little bit more in that, is that for our participant, five of them had a lesion in one of those very important areas, excepted P6. And P6 was the one where inhibition was really better uh, compared to facilitation in picture naming. So this is maybe what we can talk about and one of the hypotheses. The other thing is that, well, Again, inhibition and facilitation sometimes induce the same effect, even if we were targeting the same area. So maybe we can also start to question these parameters because these parameters were actually calculated based on motor studies. So maybe this is also something we can keep in mind that sometimes maybe using inhibition, we are not really inhibiting the cortex. So this is also interesting. And the third thing, but not the least, is the possibility to induce negative effects. Again, not a lot of studies about negative effect in RTMS. Um, we were focusing on very specific population, right? Because severe patients are super hard to, this is super hard to have severe patient in a study. This is hard in rehabilitation, in recovery. This is not the, easiest population we can work on, especially uh, in rehabilitation or in non-invasive brain stimulation studies. But still, we highlighted those negative effects. So this is important to talk about it and to understand why we had those negative effects. OK, I promise the second study will have better results. So in this second study, if you remember, we were talking about these cortical targets. So they are most of the study are always focusing on this right interfrontal gyrus. And what we know from language study is that just the production of a word will underpin a very large interconnected network. And this is a study from Hessling that have shown just areas um, implicated in the production of one word. And they highlighted different areas, including motor areas through the dorsal pathway. And what we know also is that the excitability of the motor cortex uh, that has been measured in TMS and phonological subscore, meaning scores like repetition, for example, they are both predictors of aphasia recovery. And we also know that phonological and motor aspects of language are very uh, related and they are both crucial for recovery. So the idea was that instead of thinking about just one area, we will think about 
the streams, the ventral stream, the dorsal phalangical stream, and more thinking about a network. And thinking also about that language is not working alone. It's also working with uh, executive function, working memory. And the idea was to stimulate the output, so the primary motor cortex area, to stimulate it indeed all the dorsal uh, phonological stream. Why? Because what we know about RTMS is that it will affect not only the targeted area, but also all the network that is connected with this area. So that's why we thought it was important because this motor area is important for um, language recovery and because it's also part of this uh, dorsal phonological stream. So that was the idea. And our hypothesis was that for chronic patients with aphasia characterized by phonological impairments, we will use inhibitory RTMS targeting the right motor cortex of the lips, and this will induce language improvements. For this study, we included three patients with chronic mild to moderate aphasia and phonological impairments. Phonological impairments, meaning they had difficulties in repetition tasks, and they were also um, having phonological errors in picture naming tasks, but also in spontaneous speech. Um, we targeted the right motor cortex of the lips, and we use inhibitory stimulation. So this time following the theory of anterior imbalance. Um, and we use the picture naming task. This will look like the previous uh, design you've seen. So six weeks, patient is coming three times a week and it will have two weeks intervention. So a six stimulation session in total. And again, we are randomizing the baseline length. Uh, we also did some, I didn't mention it yet, but we also did some EEG investigations because we were also very interested in understanding more how RTMS can modify electrophysiological processes. I will not talk about it today, but if you have some things you want to discuss about it, I will be happy to. Um, okay, so going back to this behavioral results. So what we found is that for, so this is the classic, one of the classic view you can have on single case experimental design. What you can see is for accuracy in the picture naming task. And what you can see is the result for P1. So you will have here in the um, solid line, you will have the mean of the baseline. This is the intervention period in orange. And this is a two standard deviation envelope. So the objective is to have a maximum of points above this two standard deviation envelope. Um, this is one of the part of SCAD analysis. We have statistical analysis, as I mentioned in the first study before. Uh, so for this first patient, we can see that there is a slight improvement and we have some points that are really close to this two standard deviation envelope and one point that is above, only one point. Why? Probably because of the ceiling effect. I'm not sure you can see, but we almost reached 100%. And this point was actually at 100%. So um, we have mostly a, a ceiling effect, but still we can expect the statistics to be aligning with, with an improvement. For the second patient, it was a little bit more clear because you can see that um, after the first week in the intervention period, all the points are above this two standard deviation envelope. And so we can clearly see an effect of the stimulation. And for the third patient, it was even more clearer, maybe, because you can see that there is a gap between the last point of baseline and the first point of intervention. However, if you remember a little bit about this, uh, I, I mentioned before that in SCAD methodology, we take into account the old baseline and the baseline trend if needed. And for this participant, you can see here that there is clearly a learning effect, right? So during the first two weeks, she improved their score just being doing the task over and over. And after these two weeks learning effect, you can see that this is not improving anymore for two other weeks. But because we are using single case experimental design and this is mandatory in single case experimental design, I will have to take that into account for our statistical analysis. And this is what we did. And this is why for patient three, we have non-significant results for uh, accuracy. But for the other two patients, we have significant results. So 
an improvement of accuracy in the picture naming task. However, for all three patients, we can see a decrease in phonological errors, which was also our target. So the goal is achieved for this study. We have improvement of accuracy. We have improvement of, uh, I mean, a decrease in phonological errors. So we can see that we can say that there is a positive effect of RTMS targeting the right motor cortex of the lips. So this highlights, of course, again, because there is a lot of studies about that, the implication of motor area in language processes, not only as an output, but also as a potential cortical target for RTMS to modulate the linked network. And this study also highlighted something important, which was the interest of individualizing the RTMS based on clinical behavior. Again, this is something that we can implement in clinics because it's not hard. We're not using here fancy stuff like fMRI. This is great. I love fMRI, especially now that I'm in South Carolina. But this is also very easy to, easy to use as a clinical practice and something we can say. Uh, to clinicians. So this is very interesting. What was interesting in that study is that one patient. We had in this three patients, the first one who was a fluent English and French speaker. So uh, she was very happy about the results because she really felt she has really the feeling that she was improving. But she also said, you know, because in France, we don't have a lot of uh, speech language pathologist in English. So she said, you know, I also realized that I was improving in English, even if I don't have speech pathology, it's been a while, but I think I, it really helped for my English too. So what Joanna did, this is Joanna, Joanna Siklafidou, she has been working uh, in Bordeaux for a few, it was supposed to be a few weeks, but it turns out to be a few years. <laughs> uh, so she was working with us. And um, after I ended my PhD, she decided to continue working with this one participant. And uh, this is a result that we had in French for, for her. And what we can see is that, as mentioned, improvement in both accuracy and phonological errors. And what we know from this participant is that we have the same pattern of errors between French and English. However, uh, her aphasia in English was much more severe than French. She has not recovered that much in English compared to French. Uh, what was good is that Joanna was speaking English fluently, so she was able to perform this study in English without any issue. So we did the exactly same study, but in English, using a picture naming task in English. Um, a little bit of background in bilingual aphasia. This is not really my domain, main domain, but a little bit of background. What we know also about um, the type of errors in bilinguals uh, with aphasia is that they will have more pathological language switching, which is not supposed to happen so often in neurotypicals, right? It happens to me all the time, but it's not supposed to happen uh, uh, to happen a lot. What we also have from different study on bilingual is that the cortical organization of both languages may overlap. And this may also depend on the similarities between languages. French and English are a lot similar in different ways. So we can expect them to be a little bit similar. That may explain why she felt like she improved in English even if it was not our target. And um, I mentioned it before, we don't have a lot of studies on non-invasive brain simulation and bilingual aphasia, but we have this one study that highlighted improvement in picture naming accuracy and picture description tasks in both languages of bilingual patients. So we wanted to replicate that in English. And this is what Joanna did. And what we found is that for naming accuracy, this was really much more obvious than French result, right? Because you can see here that all the points after the first stimulation session were above these two standard deviation baseline. So you have intervention here. That can be explained because if you look at it, look at it here, as I mentioned before, her severity in English was really um, 
she has more severe aphasia in English. So in French, she almost goes up to 100% at the end of uh, the protocol. And here, the highest point is at 60%. So she had a, a more severe aphasia. Uh, she had a mild aphasia actually in French and moderate aphasia uh, in English. So she improved in naming accuracy that was statistically significant, and she also decreased the number of phonological errors. So same type of improvement. What Joanna looked like also, because she was focusing on this bilingual aphasia, was the number of pathological language switching. And what she found out is that there were also a decrease in the number of pathological language switching. So all those results are mostly positive and very interesting. Uh, the first one was that we have the same type of improvement for this participant in both um, French and English. And this may make us hypothesize that uh, there is a common representation in the lexical phonological processes for this participant. And that for this participant, L2 was acquired through the same neural structure than L1. This is one of the hypotheses why this works the same in both English and French. And what was also super interesting, and I think this is the, we didn't really expect it to be, but this is also something I was super interested to learn from Joanna when she presented me the results, is that um, we don't have a lot of studies about RTMS and postural cognitive impairments. So I'm not talking here about language, I'm co talking about co other cognitive impairments. Uh, we have this one meta-analysis that said that RTMS can help to improve executive function and working memory. Um, uh, and most of the studies targeted the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. But there is really, really a few studies. I don't remember the exact number, but it's like less than 10 studies. So really a few studies. And most of the studies will use very global tests, such as the MOCA, for example. Um, so we don't have a lot of studies, but what we know is that it could improve also those cognitive impairments. And what we know also is that these bilingual people will engage cognitive control network to achieve language selection. So, um, and that the prefrontal cortex is responsible for selection and inhibition. So if we go a little bit more further, could we have impacted this prefrontal cortex? That was not the idea, but could we have impacted it with our stimulation? Maybe. The, the idea is that it can be an hypothesis. You can maybe find it a little bit too far away, but still there is no, um, there is a lot of connect, connection between this primary motor area and our dorsal prefrontal cortex. But what is also, what I want to highlight here is also that why not trying to stimulate it directly, this pre dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex for this bilingual patient with aphasia that will fight a lot against this inhibitory executive difficulties because we know that to speak several languages, we, we have to think about what we are like I'm doing, and this is the end of the talk, so I'm tired. <laughs> but this is something we, we, are, uh, we are doing every day. And for those patients, maybe helping them a little bit by stimulating one area that is specialized in and one network that could help those, uh, those um, cognitive processes might also be another target to try. OK, that was all for, for Joanna's study. And to conclude a little bit about um, individualizing aphasia, uh, RTMS in post-stroke aphasia, what we highlighted in all these studies of my PhD and the study of Johanna is that we had heterogeneous results between studies, and that really um, underscore the importance to the necessity to individualize this RTMS treatment. Um, because we want to, of course, improve side effects. That was the objective. When I started my PhD, my objective was to improve the side effects of RTMS in post-stroke aphasia recovery, but we had negative effects. So this is also 
something very important to think about the necessity of individualizing because we can prevent this negative effect. We will talk a little bit more about clinical practice after a break. <laughs> and the idea will be to optimize these parameters, keeping in mind this theory of transcarlosal imbalance that could work in many cases maybe, but that may be too simple to explain all the crucial role of the right hemisphere in different situation in different localization. And to target, to choose our target based on clinical profile and what maybe we were missing for the first study and on lesion. I wanted to highlight some research perspective. I was just talking about uh, lesion and there is actually um, one research perspective that is going on now in Bordeaux uh, because they are uh, focusing this time on imagery data. This is also something very clinical because that can be implemented by clinician because it's supposed to be easy, but first we have to see if it's working. But the idea is that you will have like here, okay, I will show you here. You will have like here a connectome. This is a study of Talosi um, that um, uh, put up the word disconnectome and the idea of this disconnectome. So you will have here a connectome that will represent all the connection in the brain for a specific task. And you will have your stroke lesion. And what you will do is that you will put your stroke lesion in this connectome and that will uh, give you a disconnectome. Thanks to that, they were able to predict aphasia recovery. This is not the idea here. The idea will be to choose the good cortical target, the good network to enhance, to improve aphasia recovery. And this is what they are doing now in Bodo. Uh, of course, the second step, I'm here in Dr. Desai's lab. So I've been working a lot on um, semantic processes in the brain in neurotypicals. That's also important. And of course, the next idea, I've been working on phonological impairments. The next idea will be to work on semantic impairments or even to work on difficulties to access to semantic information because we also have a lot of people with aphasia that has difficulties to access to semantic information even if all the semantic system is preserved. So this is also something we could work about. What kind of area can we stimulate to improve these uh, semantic impairments? And the other idea, of course, I'm a speech language pathologist. I didn't use speech uh, language therapy during my studies for several reasons, but that could also be very interesting to use RTMS targeting semantic impairments and associated with speech language therapy that will also be tailored to this uh, targeted uh, network. So this is also the idea that we could implement in research. What about a clinical perspective, right? So this approach, as I mentioned, is easy to adapt in a clinical practice, but the very important thing to say, and I think mostly for friends, because now we can use it as a clinical practice, but we don't really have guidelines. So uh, what I can say is that it needs to be managed and it needs to be monitored. We need to monitor the effect of the simulation to be sure that the simulation is improving the patient, that is not inducing negative effect, or that is not just not working, because we also have patients that had stimulation and it's not doing any effects. So this is a very, very great opportunity to be able to use RTMS in a clinical, uh, clinical care, but it's also dangerous. I mean, <laughs> it also has to be monitored to be, to be sure to induce the expected effect. So in conclusion, this clinical and research perspective are promising and they open new avenues uh, for improving aphasia care and recovery. Before wrapping up, I wanted to thank you, my Bordeaux Geneva team with my both co-directors for my PhD, so uh, Bertrand Bertrandguise and Grégoire Piton, and also of course, Joanna for the last study of uh, bilingual aphasia. And uh, of course, uh, my new lab here, uh, which is super great and with who I hope I will be. I'm working a lot on semantic uh, impairments and semantic in general. And I, of course, hope to implement here uh, studies on RTMS and post aphasia again. So thank you very much for your attention.
you so um let's go to questions from the room first you can i, I have my back to the room so you can you can moderate, <laughs> you can moderate that yourself okay <laughs> please go hey thank you so much for a really great talk i was just curious and, and this relates to your last point uh what pms is recommended in fact yeah do you have any sense for how widely it's used and, and how it's used yeah yes so it's not very widely used in france it has been used actually in bordeaux for several years as a clinical routine uh, for my directors and now that it's authorized in france for clinical care uh, it's still authorized but it's not reimbursed so that means we still have this question however there is a few centers that contacted us to know what kind of treatment they could give the patient. And yeah, that, that's mostly why. But, but that was recommended as the same level than speech language pathology. So that's why I think it will be more and more used in France. But recommendations are not super clear on, well, if you read meta-analysis, they will say, okay, use inhibitory stimulation targeting right in for frontal gyrus, but this is not enough for all diverse type of, type of patient we have. So, yeah. If you don't mind trying to uh, uh, repeat the question from the room. Yeah, my working memory is not, not so one. great. But, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> yeah, great talk. I had a similar question at the Zigfos, uh, so I think that's uh, clear. I was just wondering if it's like standardized, um, what the clinicians do, or because I, I thought it's approved by the health insurance and then the costs are covered. Yes. But if they're not, then you, like the clinicians can modify the yes. protocols or- Okay, so the question is about uh, parameters and if there is a standardized use of RTMS for post aphasia. So there is not, that's also why. We have this recommendation of Rossi that are super great about also side effects because we can have some side effects. This is not a majority, but it can, it's like, I don't remember the exact number, but it's not a great number, but there is risk using RTMS. So you should also be aware of that. You should be trained and you should be aware of taking care of those um, risks. Uh, but there is no recommendation of what specific targets and what specific parameters. That's why I guess if you want to use, and you don't speak to anybody, if you want to use RTMS, you will use the classic target, which is right in front of the inhibitory parameters. Uh, so I have a question related yeah, sure. to the target. Um, and I was just wondering how accurate it, it is, because you mentioned it was like uh, the motor cortex, the, the lip region. How sure can you be that it's targeting only this region mm -hmm. and not you know, mm -hmm. having the current dispersion? And if there are some cases where the left paralegional side was stimulated. <laughs> so this, oh, I should repeat it. <laughs> uh, the question was about uh, how accurate the stimulation is and how can we know that we are targeting, for example, the lips motor cortex and not other region and how we can do that also in the left hemisphere with the lesion. So this is also something we can well, for the lip motor cortex, it's really easy, actually. You don't need anything because you can make the lip move. So <laughs> this is uh, something we can do in TMS. So you just send an impression on the motor cortex and you will have uh, the control to your, <clears throat> well, first hand, then finger, then lip moving. So this is something very convenient. Uh, you don't have to have any specific material, but of course, the best way to, um, I mean, the more most accurate way uh, would be to have a T1 scan of the participant and a neural navigation system. And thanks to that, you can be pretty accurate. And after that, the focal of the RTMS will depend on the on the machine. But for example, we can be as accurate as um, in Broca's area. So in the interfrontal gyrus, there is different parts. And most of the time, they are not just saying, okay, we are stimulating the inferfrontal gyrus. They are saying we are stimulating the past triangularis of this area. So we are pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. And about the left side, um, well, the idea is that there is um, studies that have stimulated this left side using facilitatory stimulation. 
the idea would be this time to have neural navigation because thanks to that you can see the lesion and not stimulating in the middle of it because it will not have any effects. <laughs> so you can stimulate in, uh, for example, in perilesional peri areas or areas that are not touched by the lesion. This is actually what we did with this left-handed patient. We tried it to, so he had a big, 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 super big stroke, but not a stroke in the right inferior gyrus. So he has like this big stroke and this inferior gyrus that was completely preserved. So we said, okay, we can try it. Try to simulate this right inferior gyrus. We use facilitatory stimulation over it. So in order to focus on this interhemispheric imbalance, um, but actually it didn't work at all, probably because this area was still preserved, but disconnected from everything. So this is interesting to be able to do that. You seem to solve the sound problem, so you can you don't know you no longer have to repeat. It. Okay, thank you. <laughs> That's good. Let me ask a good question. So first, you get a good job. But um, in the first study where you had a participant who um, did have more semantic errors um, yes. at the end, I was curious of how you were coding those responses, um, especially since you're focusing on severe aphasia. I was curious if they were having um, a lot of semantic errors initially, and um, you saw more at the end, or is it a case where mm -hmm. like maybe they had no responses on the naming assessment or neologisms, mm -hmm. yes. and then had more sem semantic errors, which they're getting yeah. closer, which Sometimes as a we want to celebrate that, but so I was just curious of how the participant was doing. That's, okay, that's a super interesting question. And that's a big debate we had with my directors actually, because we were, we were um, after a few weeks of doing this study, we were not expecting anymore having more accurate responses for half of the participant because we were just expecting to have responses, right? So of course, sometimes this uh, semantic errors might be seen as improvement. And this is something we, we could have interpreted as it is. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, yeah, this is a, the way we interpret it there. Um, <clears throat> probably because this, this participant also showed improvement in accuracy in the inhibitory simulation. So that's why we also interpreted it as this. Uh, and because he was also able to, we were also able to calculate it from him, accuracy score and scores in general. But we had this one participant that was, that has a stereotypy. So <laughs> for this type of participants, we had at the time some words that came, they were not related to the picture, but we were so happy to have something else. So we celebrated it, as you mentioned, but we 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 didn't report it as it is. But but I I rely on you. I totally agree. <laughs> More production, right? <laughs> That's sometimes just a goal. So we have no questions from the room anymore. We have a lot of questions online as well. Lots of people are thinking along with you based on the single subject uh, design, okay. like what could be going on with this patient. So we have a number of questions like that. Um, the first question, though, is from uh, Kirana Tsapkini. Um, thank you for this so interesting talk. Since the transcolossal imbalance is not supported by your results, and you find both inhibitory and facilitatory effects of TMS in the contralesional hemisphere. Would you consider, or are there any studies that you know of, uh, TMS in the ipsilesional hemisphere? Yeah, so there is, um, there is actually, most of the study will focus on the right hemisphere, but there is several studies that focus on the, on the left hemisphere that can be found. As I mentioned, there will, a lot of them will target this inferior gyrus, left hemisphere, facilitatory stimulation, and they have shown good results. Uh, the reason why they mostly use inhibitory is because I think they, they found that that was more efficient compared to facilitatory stimulation. But yes, that can completely be used. And that's also used in clinical practice because we are using perilaser, super hard, <laughs> perilaser, I will not do it. <laughs> Very lesional <coughs> stimulation. Oh. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, and then we have a question from Brenda Rapp. 
For P6, this is about your first study, okay. I wonder if the increase in semantic errors could be seen as positive because they are an improvement over perseverations, which yeah. decreased. Mm -hmm. Or am I confused about the pattern you reported? Yeah, no, no, you're, you're totally not confused. That aligns with Sarah's question. Uh, yeah, this is the interpretation we did. Again, big debate on how to interpret that. We even at a time proposed to have like a production score where we'll, we'll be having like the number of phonological and semantic errors combined together with the accuracy to try to see if there is something here that patients were more, were pro have more, production of, of uh, words and errors, but still they are pro producing something that goes um, up to it. But but this is how we interpreted it. And we also looked at non-responses, neologism, and this is the main result I presented where the results that were more important to present, but this is that, that's completely true. This is not published yet, so I could still make some changes. <laughs> And, and Brenda also asks, uh, it, it's related to that. How do you define phonological errors? In your... So phonological errors, because this is also a question I had. Uh, the, I don't know if it's related to the first study or the second one, but this is also the question I had to distinguish between phonetic errors and phonological errors. So you also take into account, the study was not about apraxia of speech so or dysartria. So we really distinguish this type of errors from phonological errors, which will be a problem of phonemes and not a distortion of phonemes, but like an addition of phonemes, for example. Um, and this is how we define it. But we, we really distinguish it so, so we won't have any overlapping between having the motor cortex being stimulated and improving apraxia of speech. So we distinguished it in the article that is published. Thank you. We have a question from Maria Ivanova. In study one, interestingly, P3 and P6, who both showed RTMS treatment effects, had the longest baseline periods. Yeah, true. Could it possibly be the case that you had a better estimate of their baseline, which then allowed you to capture the treatment effects? A similar pattern is sort of observed in the second study with patients <laughs> with longer baselines showing slightly more pronounced treatment effects. Alternatively, maybe it has something to do with priming the language system prior to stimulation. Curious to hear your thoughts on this observation. Yeah. Super. Either a mathematical effect or a priming effect. Yeah, <laughs> super interesting. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, the idea of this baseline randomization is really to capture if um, the baseline length will have an impact and to prevent uh, just the time to have an impact on, on the results. But yeah, Definitely, because we have a super long baseline, so we can capture more precisely the variation that the patient will have. So yes, but for all participants, if I remember correctly, in the accuracy, there were not the baseline was stable. So there is first a statistical test that is performed on just the baseline, and we can determine if there is um, an increase, a statistical significant increase or decrease during the baseline, and then we take that into account. And from what I remember, there were not for all of the participants, but yeah, I understand the point. And especially this is what we've seen with patient three in the study two, uh, where we can definitely see this increase in the first two weeks and then the stabilization of the results. And actually we should, if we were uh, perfect, <laughs> we should, we are supposed to wait for the baseline to be stable before starting the treatment. And this is what happened for P3. We, waited for it, but still we have to take this baseline trend into account. I don't remember the second part of the question. Did I answer that? Well, so that's that basically deals with the mathematical okay. part. I think the other question or the, the other part of the question was really alternatively, it's not also possible that because they have this longer yes. baseline, they've had more priming, yes. which so okay. they're better prepared yeah. for the effects of yeah. RG. So yes, that's also definitely a positive uh, possibility but because we are using single case experimental design i hope we control that more than in randomized clinical trial where you just have pre-post tests but but yeah that could be a possibility yeah okay um then uh, uh we have a question from maya henry and after that i think 
uh, we should uh, wrap up. Uh, Maya asks, thanks for an interesting talk. Could you elaborate on what the naming treatment task was? Were patients simply repeatedly attempting to name pictures? Was there any feedback given? Can you provide some information about the stimuli? Yeah. Were standard sets of pictures used? Yes. Okay. So this is um, the picture naming task used was um, the D120, uh, which is from Marina Laganero's lab in Geneva. Um, and this is just black and white pictures you have to name. And we did not provide any feedbacks. Uh, we had the first time the patient was coming, we presented all items once with the name written and the patient be able to uh, pronounce it and we correct it if needed, but just before the study. And then during the study, there were never feedbacks and never language simulation. I mean, this is language simulation because they are trying to speak, right? So they see pictures and they are trying to speak. So in a certain time, we can say that this is language simulation, but there were no feedbacks uh, from us and there were no rehabilitation. Uh, the idea was we could have added this um, rehabilitation that may have improved our results, but the, the idea was that we were also super interested in uh, EEG results. So we were also uh, using EEG to be aware of the, to understand more about the electrophysiological changes induced by RTMS. So that's why we, we couldn't have also uh, speech therapy because we didn't want to uh, deal with both effects of therapy, language therapy, and also uh, RTMS. Great. Thank you very much. This Just a, a, a tiny one then from, from myself, if I may. So, <laughs> sure. uh, in the first study, you, you, so your hypothesis in the first study focuses on the, on the effect of aphasia severity, right? So you had a hypothesis based on that. That's correlated with lesion size, but certainly not perfectly, right? So there's people with really large lesions who actually are not that severe and the other way around. So have you looked at lesion size as the predictor? No, we didn't. And this is one of the, probably with localization, this is one of the major limitation of this study is that we didn't focus on uh, on, oh, on lesion size. So we, we have patients, I don't know if you remember, we, we have a patient mm -hmm. that had a very small lesion actually and patient that had a very 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 large uh, lesion so yeah that c can definitely explain the some of the results and why patient some patient didn't respond at any stimulation this is one of the hypotheses yeah definitely yeah definitely okay unless there's other questions oops yes from the room then uh we thank you very much sophie and uh, we hope to see everybody again in a month's time uh for the talk by stephanie yes so thanks everybody thank, thank you thank you very much <laughs>